here from UCLA. Uh, he did his PhD at, uh, at uh, Berkeley, working with Michael Jordan and getting uh, experience and knowledge in, in uh, a wealth of uh, knowledge that I think served him well in uh, human genetics. And he did his postdoc with uh, David Wright at, uh, <coughs> at uh, Harvard. Uh, and we're happy to have him. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, so thanks for showing up, and I'm happy for this opportunity. Um, I also would like to apologize. I have a bad throat, so I may not be able to speak too loud. But I hope you can all hear me. Uh, okay, you can you hear me? The back. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> all right. So um, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, kind of uh, 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 is, is a departure from uh, the the kinds of things I, I talked about in my tutorial uh, in week one, uh, where uh, I introduced this. Uh, uh, the study of uh, admixture as as a, an important area in uh, human genetics and human population genetics, and uh, just to kind of uh, motivate uh, kind of the big takeaways from from what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the reason why we'd like to study admixture uh, are several fold. The first is it uh, it's a confounder for all kinds of downstream genetic analyses. Um, so whether you're doing GWAS or you're doing things like scans for selection. Um, admixture is an important factor to take into account. So that's one reason. A uh, second reason is uh, <coughs> um, if we actually learn about admixture and how it affects the structure of the genome, you can actually use this to gain uh, additional power. So admixture is an important source of signal that we can leverage to do interesting kinds of analyses that would not be possible uh, in homogeneous populations. So to the extent that we can learn and use the structure, uh, it can actually be a very powerful tool. And finally, from a, a methodological point of view, from for those of us who are interested in statistical modeling algorithms, uh, I think you, there are lots of very interesting uh, methodological challenges uh, that come up here. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about in, in today's talk is uh, partly the biological problems uh, that are presented in the study of admixture, but also uh, I want to kind of give you a glimpse of uh, what are the statistical and computational issues that arise. And uh, we've done some work in, in, in uh, dealing with some of these problems, but uh, there are plenty of uh, challenging problems that I'd be happy to talk about on, uh, offline. <coughs> so um, uh, another reason uh, that the study of admixture is interesting is as we are getting more and more uh, genome sequence data, what we are understanding, at least in the case of human populations, is that admixture is very, very common. Um, so we have, uh, we now know that there's been admixture within the last hundreds of years in populations like African Americans and Latinos, but it's not just a recent phenomenon. Uh, so for example, if you go back to the time scales of thousands of years, we know of admixtures in uh, large population groups like South Asians, uh, South African hunter-gatherers. And as you go even further back in time, deep in human history, to the time scales of tens of thousands of years, uh, we now know that there's been admixture between highly diverged populations. So for example, we know that there's been admixture between um, modern humans and archaic humans, like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So the focus of my talk today is on these deep admixture events between these highly diverged population groups. And this is what we call archaic admixture. So uh, just to set the context of why we are interested in archaic admixture and why I think it's a really exciting topic, uh, in human population genetics, um, so uh, one of the one of the uh, often debated questions in evolutionary biology is what's the relationship between uh, Neanderthals and modern humans? So um, <coughs> modern humans and Neanderthals are these two large-brained human populations, and based on um, fossil and uh, uh, anthropological evidence, uh, people have known a lot about uh, the relationships between these two populations. Um, so, for example, it's known that modern humans uh, evolved in Africa, and about 50 to 100,000 years ago, there was a migration out of Africa that populated the rest of the world. Um, in the case of Neanderthals, on the other hand, <laughs> it's been known that uh, they, they, they appear in the fossil record about 300,000 years ago, and uh, they've been found in large parts of Europe and Central Asia, and about uh, 30,000 years ago, they go extinct. Right? And um, so, uh, at least based on these, these kinds of data sets, it's been known that there's overlap between these two populations, both in space and time. And so there's been a lot of interest in understanding what are the relationships between these two groups? Uh, did they meet and did they interbreed? Uh, 
and um, what can we learn about the genetic similarities and differences by looking at uh, uh, the, uh, whether interbreeding occurred. So, so this, these were, again, kinds of questions that were uh, central and often debated in uh, anthropology and, and archaeology. Uh, but in the last five years, it's become a, a genomic problem. And the reason for that is uh, because of kind of breakthroughs in our technology to get genome sequences from these old bones. And so um, <coughs> as a result of uh, a, a lot of pioneering work that's been done uh, um, uh, in ancient DNA sequencing, uh, we now have uh, genome sequences from uh, archaic populations like the Neanderthals. Um, so the first Neanderthal genome was sequenced in 2010. And um, so this was a, uh, a 1.3x genome from a Neanderthal, uh, uh, from actually three Neanderthal bones found in a cave in Croatia. Uh, but since then, we have two additional genomes. Uh, one in particular that was sequenced in 2014 uh, was from uh, 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 was found in a cave in Siberia, and uh, remarkably, this, so this uh, has been sequenced to uh, 52x coverage. So it's a high coverage, high quality Neanderthal genome whose quality is comparable to uh, most modern human genome sequences that we have today. Okay. So, um, so these kinds of genome sequences are now allowing us to uh, answer at very high resolution uh, the kinds of questions about interbreeding and uh, genetic changes between Neanderthals and modern humans. <coughs> so, um, so my talk has several, several parts. And um, again, a lot of the techniques that I'm going to be presenting are fairly general. They are applicable uh, to lots of instances of admixture. But I thought this is a, this is a very interesting, important example. Uh, and, and so all of this is going to be centered around looking at the archaic admixture scenario. So the first thing we'd like to be able to understand is um, we have genomes from several populations, in this case, Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, did these populations admix? So that's kind of the first thing. So very abstractly, um, we have so um, uh, four populations, right? So these are uh, populations that uh, that exist, and we have genome sequences from. Um, <clears throat> and the question we are trying to answer is, if you look at population one and two, um, do they form a clade? So is this is this, so this is a tree that relates these four populations. Do populations one and two form a clade relative to populations three and four? Right? The alternative is if they don't form a clade, then there's a possibility that there was mixture in the ancestry of populations one or two. Right? So think of this as you're looking at, say, Neanderthals and a human population, and three and four would represent outgroup populations, at, uh, say, for example, chimpanzee and, and uh, other populations that we have genome sequences from. So we like to devise a test for population admixture. And <coughs> the basic idea that we're going to be using um, goes back to kind of the conditional independence properties of allele frequencies in these populations. So this I talked about a little bit in my tutorial uh, in week one. Um, so the idea is we're going to be looking at um, this expression. So we are going to look at allele frequencies in populations one, two, three, and four. And we're looking at the expectation of these differences in allele frequencies across these two populations. So intuitively, the idea is if there was no admixture, the difference in allele frequencies between population one and two, and the difference in allele frequencies between populations three and four are going to be uncorrelated or independent. And so this quantity is actually going to be zero in expectation. So, so here is one way to see it more formally. So, so this is, you can think of this as a, a graphical model. And the basic idea is, if I condition on the allele frequency at a parent node, the allele frequency at these two children are going to be independent of everybody else. Right? So that's, the, that's kind of the probabilistic interpretation of this model. So in this graphical model, we can now sh make the following conditional independence assertions. So if you give me the allele frequency at x5, right, the frequency is at 1 and 2 are going to be independent of the frequencies at three and four. Okay, so that's one assertion. The second assertion is given x5, allele frequencies at one and two are independent of each other. So once you've given me the parent, the allele frequencies at the children are independent. Then finally, the expectation of the allele frequency at one given the allele frequency <coughs> at five is simply the allele frequency at five. 
So this is a consequence of neutrality. Right? So if things are neutral, then the expected allele frequency doesn't change over time. And so this holds both for x1 and x2. All right? So given these statements, now we can look at this expression, this quantity, which is the difference of allele frequencies in 1, 2 versus 3 and 4. And we look at it conditioned on, on the allele frequency at x5. So, so this expression is now going to factor into two expressions because of the first statement. And if you look at this expression, at e, uh, the, each of these factors, again, we can write it as each of the individual expectations. And finally, because of the property of neutrality, each of them is going to be x5, and so it's going to be 0. Right? So under this, this model of tree-like evolution, where 1 and 2 form a clade, this quantity this expectation is going to be zero. So, um, so just to kind of uh, uh, this, th these kinds of quantities are what are called phylogenetic invariants. For those of you who come from the phylogenetics community, and they actually trace their uh, history back to uh, work done by James Lake and Felsenstein and others. Um, but they have now been used more recently as tests for admixture. Yeah. <laughs> Um, would this still be true? Uh, no, this wouldn't, would not necessarily be true. But again, so this is, once you condition on x5, then the final expression is going to take the expectation over x5. So the final quantity is the, so that, is this quantity. So now, condition on x5. yeah, you can condition on any of the in, in, internal nodes, right? Yeah, so you're just doing iterated expectation or, or the tower property. And, and so, so you write this as the expectation or of the previous quantity conditioned on x5, and that is, of course, you. <coughs> All right. So, so that motivates um, a statistic, a test for admixture that was proposed in, uh, in, in, in Green et al., which was the, the, the paper that uh, described the first draft Neanderthal genome. And so this is uh, a, a statistic that's called the d-statistic. And the basic idea is you're looking at this expectation. And so you're, you have a, a quantity, which is an estimator of this expectation over every step. And this quantity is designed to work uh, even if you have uh, a single individual from each of these populations. So let's say you just have one individual genome from each of these populations. So then you can, you can actually show that this expectation is equal to the probability of seeing a pattern which is which we call ABBA, ABBA, which means population one has allele A, population two has allele B, population three has allele B, and so on. Versus another quantity which is called BABA, which is population one has allele B, A, and so on. Okay? So you, if you, you, you pick one individual genome from each of the four populations, and you look at what alleles they carry. They either fall in ABBA or BABA. If they don't fall in either, you discard those. And now you just count uh, the, the number of sites which show one pattern versus the other. And so under your null model, where there's no admixture, where you have random mating and things are evolving neutrally, this d-statistic uh, has expectation of zero. Okay. Um, <coughs> and the way we actually test for this is uh, uh, to compute the standard errors on this d-statistic, we use a block jackknife. Um, and and th that allows us to test whether it is statistically significantly different from zero. So this is what uh, was observed when, um, when, they, when they looked at different combinations. So the D statistic here is looking at Neanderthals and CHIM as two of the genomes. And the other two genomes are going to be pairs of modern human populations. So specifically, we are looking at, say, pairs of African populations or you're looking at French and Han, so European East Asian population. And then you can look at, uh, say, for example, French and San, which is a European and an African population. And so for each of these, you can compute ABBAs and BABAs and convert that into a D statistic and with a standard error. And finally, you, you convert that into a Z score. Right? So the basic observation is when you look at pairs of populations, let's say you're looking at um, San and Yoruba, pairs of African populations, 
the Z score is not very impressive. Uh, but when you start comparing French versus San, or when you compare Han versus San, so this is non-African versus African populations, then you see that these Z statistics, uh, these Z scores are statistically significant. So the basic idea, the basic observation is these African and non-African populations, they seem to form a clade relative to Neanderthals. But non-Africans are genetically closer to Neanderthals than are Africans. So this would reject the hypothesis that, uh, that there's been no admixture or there's been uh, a symmetric relationship of Africans and non-Africans relative to Neanderthals. <coughs> All right, so, so that kind of an observation, this observation that uh, Neanderthals are genetically closer to non-Africans compared to Africans, uh, can be explained if there was admixture. So the model is you have Africans uh, evolving in Africa, then you have the out of Africa dispersal. And if you had Neanderthal admixture at this point in time, then each of the non-African populations would be more similar to the Neanderthals compared to the African populations. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so, so in going back here, the Neanderthals would be, say, this, this node. So, so this doesn't correspond to uh, uh, being at the same point in time. So this just corresponds to the fact that you have genome sequences from, from these populations. Right? Yeah. Um, can you think of other possible connections to this similarity and possible Yeah, so that's the... Um, so, I mean, so if, if we're rejecting this composite null, right? random mating, neutrality, uh, and this tree-like model. So now you can think of, we, 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 uh, one, uh, one possibility is the tree-like model is wrong, but you have other possibilities. So one of them is random mating is wrong. So here is one such scenario that could also explain this model. Uh, and it's actually quite plausible. So this is called the ancient structure hypothesis. So there are many ways of talking about the ancient structure hypothesis. I'm giving you one cartoon version. The basic idea is it's a violation of random mating. So we have three populations, one, two, and three, and they, are, uh, they exist in Africa, and they don't completely mate randomly. So one exchanges genes with two, two with three. Okay? So under this setting, one, uh, one will be closer to two um, th uh, than one to three, okay? because of the way they are exchanging genes. And at some point in time, one leaves Africa, goes into Europe, <laughs> and becomes the Neanderthal. Two and three remain in Africa, but they don't completely uh, mate randomly. And at some point later in time, two exits Africa and becomes non-Africans. Right? So this is another way of looking at it. One exits to become Neanderthals, two and three again are never mixing completely, and at some point two becomes non-Africans. So in this setting, because two was closer to the Neanderthals, and never mated randomly completely with three, then the non-Africans would continue to be genetically similar to Neanderthals. Right? So this would be a setting where uh, you would ex observe this genetic proximity. <coughs> so um, these two models, however, make uh, different predictions about another parameter, which is uh, the time when Neanderthals and modern humans last exchanged genes. So in this uh, admixture model, uh, this must have happened after the split of Africans and non-Africans, right? It must, so this would have happened within the last 100,000 years or so. Whereas in the ancient structure model, this must have happened uh, before modern humans appeared in the fossil record. So it must have happened at least 200,000 years ago. <coughs> so if we can estimate the date of last genetic exchange between Neanderthals and modern humans, that would allow us to distinguish these two models. So this brings us to the second problem. So we have an admixed population, and we'd like to understand uh, or estimate the time of admixture. <coughs> so the basic idea for doing this is we're going to be using um, the clock that arises from recombination events. So here is an example where we have an archaic and a modern human uh, admixture happening. And so in the first generation after admixture, an individual is going to inherit 
full chromosomes that are either archaic or modern. But in every subsequent generation, because there's some probability of recombination happening, the chunks that you inherit from the archaics is going to get smaller. Right? So after, in the second generation, these can get broken up, uh, but they're still going to be fairly long. But say after 2,000 generations, these chunks of archaic ancestry are going to get fairly short. And so the basic idea is the longer the time since admixture, the shorter is the uh, lengths of these archaic chunks. So if we can estimate these lengths, we can estimate, potentially estimate, the times of admixtures. <coughs> so a challenge, of course, is we, to be able to do this, we need to est first figure out uh, where these chunks are and what their lengths are. And that's uh, what's called um, the local ancestry estimation problem. And it turns out that estimating these local ancestries uh, is challenging in itself. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So we'd like to be able to do this without actually solving this much harder problem of estimating local ancestries. And so, uh, so, so that's what I'm going to be talking about next. And the idea is we don't, def we don't really need the local ancestries to do this. Uh, all we need are uh, SNPs that are correlated with local ancestries. In other words, we, we need SNPs that are in LD with the local ancestries. And by averaging over SNPs that we fi find along the genome, we should still be able to make these estimations. So what's the idea? So here is the setting. We have non-Africans uh, who are getting an alpha proportion of their genome from the Neanderthals. And the time since admixture, the parameter that we care about is T. And what we are going to be looking at are mutations that arose in the Neanderthal lineage after the split of Neanderthals and modern humans. Right? So there'll be mutations. So for example, here is a place where all modern humans carry the A allele, and it has mutated to a C on the Neanderthal lineage. And um, in sp and specifically, we're going to be looking at mutations that have arisen and fixed in the Neanderthals. So we're going to be looking at pairs of these classes of mutations that are fixed differences between modern humans and Neanderthals. And first question is, what, what do these mutations look at at the time of admixture? So at time t equals 0, you're going to have Neanderthal chromosomes and modern human chromosomes coming together. And we're going to be looking at pairs of these fixed differences between Neanderthals and modern humans, separated by a genetic distance of x. Okay. So everywhere here, modern humans carry one allele, whereas Neanderthals carry the opposite allele. Now what we're going to ask is we're going to compute the covariance or, uh, uh, what, or one measure of the covariance, which is called LD, between pairs of SNPs the, that are separated by a genetic distance of x. So at time t equals 0, this covariance between any such pair of SNPs is simply going to be given by alpha times 1 minus alpha. Right? So that's, that's a simple statement. And then we'd like to understand how does this covariance change in time as the population evolves? So let's say that the population again is mating randomly and recombination along the genome is happening as a Poisson process, so with a rate parameter of one. Okay, so this is again a very standard assumption and we assume that population sizes are infinite. So there's no drift happening. So then we can show that the LD or the covariance at time t plus one has a very simple relationship to the LD at the previous generation, where it's going to be just an, an exponential decay. Right? With every generation, there's some probability of there being a recombination, and that's going to be a, a exponential because it's a Poisson process. And so we can write down the covariance in the present population as the covariance at time t equals zero uh, multiplied by this exponential decay. And the key thing here is this exponential decay has a parameter that's the time of admixture. Right? So this is a well-known uh, population genetic uh, quantity, and people have studied how LD decays with time. But what we'd like to be able to do, and what we did in this work, was we extended it to the case where it's not an infinite population size, but population sizes can be uh, arbitrary and finite. So you can have some arbitrary population size. And now we can ask, what is the expected value of the covariance between a pair of SNPs 
separated by a genetic distance of x, t generations after admixture. Okay. So now we can, so this is now governed by a diffusion process, and we can, but we can compute this quantity. And so the key thing here is it depends on a whole bunch of population genetic parameters, but the key quant dependence is the dependence on x, the genetic distance. So this this quantity has an exponential decay with the genetic distance. And the rate of decay of this exponential is given by the time of admixture t. So the, the interesting thing about this, about this uh, expression is these parameters, things like alphas and the effective population size, they only affect the intercept of this quantity, but they don't affect the, the decay with genetic distance of x. So the takeaway is if I look at how this quantity changes as a function of x, the rate of decay is going to give me the time of admixture in principle. So we can actually plot this. So we can look at an estimator of the covariance as a function of the genetic distance x. And the idea is we plot this and we fit an exponential curve to this uh, decay function. And we're going to interpret the rate of decay of this exponential function as the time of admixture. There's a couple of uh, additional technical issues that come up. It turns out that these genetic distances, x, are themselves estimated from data. So they are estimated from recombination, uh, they, are, they are estimated from data about recombination. And so they come with errors. So it, uh, and uh, you actually need to account for the fact that these x's are noisy observations of the true x's. And so we actually have a model which uh, is a Bayesian model which estimates t while taking into account errors in the x. Okay, I, I won't spend too much time on that. Um, so we now applied this model uh, to data from the 1000 Genomes Project. So these are European individuals from the 1000 Genomes Project. And so again, you see that when you plot this d against the genetic distance, you have this exponential decay. And when you actually fit the model and estimate the time of admixture, you get a, an estimate of the time of admixture of around 50,000 years ago. So the credible interval is around 47 to 64,000 years. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's important to understand how this changes as uh, uh, different parameters change. So for example, what happens when we use different Neanderthal genomes? So we have three different Neanderthal genomes, we can assess that. And what happens when, you, when we use different recombination maps, when we use different choices of SNPs uh, uh, and different um, uh, human genome uh, data sets? And what we find is we get like consistent results as we change these different underlying data sets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did run it with Africans. And you get a very old estimate. So uh, you get an estimate which would roughly, I I mean, if you, again, it's hard to uh, interpret exactly what that means, uh, but you get an estimate which is, co which is almost consistent with, say, the split times of um, human and Neanderthal populations. Um, more, I think, so this, it would be about, um, so we get estimates of, of around 8,000 generations or so, 8,000 to 10,000 generations. So, uh, yeah, like 200, around 200,000 years. <laughs> right. So, um, so since these uh, our estimates were first published, uh, a number of other studies have looked at this question. And what these studies have done is they started looking at ancient modern human genomes. So these are human genomes from individuals who lived, say, 10, 20, or 30,000 years ago. And the question you can ask is, if, say, the Neanderthal admixture happened 50,000 years ago, and you're looking at an individual who lived, say, 20,000 years, then recombination stopped when this individual uh, died. So relative to this individual, the time of admixture must be appropriately scaled. So rel relative to this individual, you should, say, you should estimate, say, 30,000 years. And, uh, and it, th they, they obtain estimates which are very consistent with those, uh, with those numbers. So that provides additional lines of evidence that there was indeed uh, recent admixture and this happened within the last 100,000 years or so. Uh, 
Right? So we now have, I think, fairly strong support for this model where there's been admixture between Neanderthals and present day non-Africans. Um, however, uh, one thing to keep in mind is, of course, this does, does not rule out uh, some contribution from the ancient structure model. And I think it's entirely plausible that there's actually contribution both from recent admixture as well as ancient structure. Uh, all that our results uh, show is that you cannot have a model of uh, purely ancient structure explaining our data. <coughs> all right, so we talked a little bit about testing for admixture and estimating the times of admixture. So the next thing we'd like to be able to do is, so now we know that there was admixture, can we locate these segments of the Neanderthal ancestry in present-day human genomes? Um, so I haven't talked about other parameters that we can estimate here. So I talked about dates. We can also estimate what proportion of the genetic ancestry of non-Africans comes from Neanderthals. And again, this uses, uh, 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 this is use, uses methods like the D-statistic for testing admixture. But using those kinds of estimates, we find that about 2% of the genetic ancestry of non-African populations traces itself to the Neanderthals. Um, so 2% seems like a fairly modest contribution. Um, and, but we like to understand what was the impact of this uh, ancestry on human biology. And so although it's a, it's a small number, uh, another way of thinking about this is that there were lots of mutations that arose in the Neanderthal lineage after they split from modern humans. So these were all novel mutations. And within a short period of time, these novel mutations entered the human population. So uh, one kind of simulation study that we did shows that uh, just soon after this admixture, uh, although the proportion of ancestry that came from Neanderthals was about 2%, uh, about 10% of the mutations or 10% of the genetic variation in the resulting admixed population uh, was Neanderthal in origin. So it could have had a large impact in terms of uh, uh, in terms of its impact on genetic variation. So what's the impact? Can we, can we study it in a systematic manner? <coughs> so here's one example of a, of a study which kind of uh, gave us hints about uh, the, the potential functional impact of Neanderthal ancestry. So this was a GWAS that we were uh, involved in. Uh, it was a GWAS uh, that was done in Mexican American populations uh, for type 2 diabetes. And so this uh, GWAS found a new risk variant for type 2 diabetes in Mexican Americans in this gene called SLC16A11. And uh, so, so this, is, um, this is the type 2 diabetes risk haplotype. It has, um, it has five non-synonymous mutations in this gene. And uh, when we looked at this geographic distribution of this type 2 diabetes risk variant, we find that it's at uh, appreciable frequencies in the Americas. So it's about 50% frequency in the Americas. Uh, fairly low frequency in, in Europe and East Asia, and essentially uh, absent in Sub-Saharan Africans. So uh, this is suggestive of what you might expect if this risk variant uh, was Neanderthal in origin. And so we did some additional analyses that show that this haplotype, this type 2 diabetes risk variant, was indeed introgressed from Neanderthals into present-day human populations. So this was an example uh, where there was a clear phenotypic consequence of these Neanderthal haplotypes. There have been several such uh, notable examples from other uh, groups. So people have looked at uh, immune-related genes as one example. So STAT2 is, a, is an immune-related gene. People have looked at the HLA, which is again important for immune function. And they found that there's substantial contribution of um, Neanderthal ancestry at these genes. And so what we'd like to be able to do is go from kind of these single locus examples to a more uh, systematic genome-wide assessment. If you look at the genome uh, as a whole, what does this distribution look like? And can we use that to understand the functional consequence? So to be able to do this, we first need to identify segments of the genome that have Neanderthal ancestry. So what I'm going to talk about next is a, a statistical model for inferring Neanderthal local ancestry. So here's the basic setup. We are looking at a European genome. It's like a test genome. And comparing it to Neanderthals and to Africans. Okay? And that's our data. And what we'd like to essentially do is go along the European genome and label it by zeros and ones. Zero says you don't have Neanderthal ancestry. One says you do. Right? So this is what we call the local ancestry. 
And essentially, we like to build a model which, which allows us to compute the probability of this local ancestry vector given our data. So the challenge, of course, is this is a high dimensional set. Right? So this local ancestry vector is uh, exponential in the number of SNPs that we have. So we need to have some reasonable way of representing this, prob this conditional probability distribution. Um, naive thing you might do is assume that each of these is independent. Each SNP has a local ancestry vector that's independent of all the other SNPs. Uh, that turns out to be not a very good thing because there is structure. We know that there's correlation going along the genome. And so we'd like to have a representation that captures the structure in the local ancestries as we move along the genome. So um, the model that we developed for this application is a model that's called a conditional random field. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with hidden Markov models and conditional random fields are a generalization of this. And uh, I don't want to get into too many of the technical details, but the basic idea is these Zs, which are the local ancestries you care about, um, are essentially coupled. So the, the, the local ancestry at, uh, at SNP2 depends on the local ancestry at SNP1 and 3, it's adjacent SNPs. But once you give me these local ancestries at the adjacent SNPs, it doesn't depend on anything else. So that's kind of the underlying assumption that we're making about this model. And so think, to think of it algebraically, you can write down the conditional probability of the local ancestry vector given data and some parameters. And this, this log conditional probability, it factors into a bunch of terms. So you have terms like this, which are a function of only the local ancestry at a SNP and the data. And then you have terms like this, which depend on the local ancestry at adjacent SNPs and the data. So you can think of these as similar to the emission uh, functions in, in uh, hidden marker models, and this is similar to the transition functions. And so these functions come associated with parameters which tell you how important they are. So these are the thetas and the lambdas. And given these parameters and these features, we can compute these probabilities. And so we can do all the usual stuff that you can do in, a, in the case of a hidden Markov model in the context of these conditional random fields. You can do inference. So given data and parameters, we can compute what's the probability of the local ancestry at SNP n given uh, your data and parameters. And this is something that can be, again, computed efficiently. So it, it's linear in the length of the sequence and quadratic in the number of states. And then we can also estimate parameters that allow you to make efficient inference. So if I give you uh, these local ancestries and the data, I can compute the parameters that maximize, say, the likelihood. And that's also something that can be done numerically. Right? So. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, insight into what's going on in this model, the model is using different kinds of information. Uh, in fact, it's, you can think of it as using three kinds of broad kinds of information. So let me give you an example of one of them. So here is an example where this is a SNP where the non-African carries an allele that matches the Neanderthal, and this allele is absent in all the Africans. Right? So if you see a, a SNP that looks like this, you might think that this has an increased probability of lying on a Neanderthal local ancestry segment. Right? So this would be a kind of feature that you use in the model, and you'd learn how important this feature is uh, in, in the context of making predictions. Yeah? yeah. This is a function in everything you do that the mean flow is unidirectional from Neanderthal to Correct, yes. Uh, there are some uh, issues. So. Um, there are some limitations in us being able to test gene flow in the opposite direction, partly because we don't have as much data, and partly because you need to sample the Neanderthals after the gene flow happened, whereas these Neanderthals could have could have lived before. So yeah, we, so I mean, it's it's a very plausible thing that there was bidirectional gene flow, but currently we don't have evidence in the opposite direction. What you call Um, yeah, um, it's a good point. 
yeah, I, I would say, I would think that a priori we don't, we, we, we are not able to differentiate that. Um, what we are able to do, of course, is we're able to test this against multiple Neanderthals, Neanderthal genomes. So again, if it happened in the ancestor of all of them, I agree you still have these issues, but at least it guards against the fact that it might be specific to one of the Neanderthals. So you made two sites that are uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a possibility. I mean, the, other, I mean, the other thing we just did is we ran it for each of the Neanderthal genomes and see how uh, concordant our inferences are. Right. So there are other kinds of features that we can use. We can not just look at single SNPs. We can look at haplotypes. And so uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, and we are also using the fact that we know when the time of admixture ha happened, and that tells us how long these haplotypes are. So all of this information is, is uh, implicitly being used by the model. All right, so uh, we took this uh, conditional random field model and we applied it to data from the 1,000 Genomes Project. Uh, we did a whole bunch of simulations. I can talk to you offline about that. But here is kind of the, the prediction that we get from this model. So uh, this is just one chromosome as an example. We ran it on Europeans, East Asians. And as a negative control, we ran it on an African uh, genome as well. And so um, kind of the, the, the qualitative conclusion is there are plenty of places where the model is confident of Neanderthal ancestry in non-Africans, relatively few such places in the Africans. Okay? So we can look at it more quantitatively. So we can ask, averaged across the genome, what proportion do we predict to be Neanderthal in Europeans, East Asians, and Africans? So again, we see that there's a major dif there's about a order of magnitude difference between Africans versus non-Africans. This is consistent with what we know based on previous statistics. We also observe more East Asian uh, Neanderthal ancestry compared to Europeans. And again, this has also been observed previously. So there have been previous uh, s statistical analyses that have shown this. So all of this is just telling us that the model is doing something reasonable uh, based on what we know from previous analyses. Uh, we can also estimate uh, accuracy, like precision and recall of this model on empirical data, not on simulations. I won't spend too much time on that, uh, but j kind of just give you the punchline, which is we can estimate that about, at about a precision of 90%, uh, we can get a recall of about 60 to 80%. Right? And finally, um, we can also estimate robustness. The fact that we have just one Neanderthal genome, uh, how representative is this? Um, of, uh, of the va variation that we see in Neanderthals. And so, so to do this, we looked at uh, two different Neanderthals. One was high coverage and another is low coverage. And we can ask how concordant are our predictions across the two different Neanderthals. And uh, generally, it seems to be quite concordant. Uh, and, and, and so it, most of the results that we see are shared uh, no matter which Neanderthal genome you're looking at. Um, uh, one interesting kind of side note here, you might ask, do we expect our results to be robust? Why do we expect a single Neanderthal genome to be uh, representative of a population? And so this turns out to uh, be something that we were lucky, that these Neanderthals uh, po populations as a whole tend to have low genetic diversity. So if you look at the heterozygosity of the Altai Neanderthal compared to modern human populations, it's about uh, a third to a fifth of the heterozygosity of present day modern human populations. So we are lucky in, 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 that, in, in that this kind of allows us to get away with having a, a single deployed Neanderthal genome to do inference with. All right. So hopefully, uh, having convinced you that these results are, are reasonable and consistent, now we'd like to uh, look at what we can learn about biology from these inferences. So here is one way of summarizing our data. Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking these predictions at an individual level and averaging them to get population level maps of Neanderthal ancestry. So you're here you're going along the, along the genome. Um, the y-axis is telling you what fraction of individuals at a given position in the genome are confidently uh, inferred to have Neanderthal ancestry. And we're doing this both for Europeans in red and East Asians in green. So, so these are the kinds of maps that we can compute. And we'd like to understand uh, uh, what we can learn about, about these segments based on these maps. So the kinds of questions we'd like to understand is, um, 
this variation that you see along the genome. Um, uh, there are places in the genome where many individuals carry Neanderthal ancestry. So there are peaks of Neanderthal ancestry that we see here. And then there are places in the genome where essentially nobody carries Neanderthal ancestry, which we call deserts. And uh, uh, is this consistent with neutral, neutral uh, evolution, or do we have to invoke uh, selection to understand this? And then can we say something about the impact of these kinds of variants on phenotype? So we first looked at these peaks of Neanderthal ancestry. And uh, here is uh, an, an extreme example. So this is a region on chromosome 9, where uh, Europeans today have more than 60%. 60% of Europeans today carry the Neanderthal allele. So this should be contrasted with, say, the 2% that would have carried it around 50,000 years ago. And uh, so, so these are examples of locations where uh, uh, drift cannot explain the increase in frequency of the Neanderthal allele. So these are candidates for positive selection on the Neanderthal ancestry. Um, so we, we also try to understand what were the selection pressures on these uh, regions. And so to do this, we looked at um, Go analyses of genes which have elevated proportions of Neanderthal ancestry. And we find several of these categories, but one of them that's consistent across different populations is uh, the Go category associated with keratin filament formation. So this is like skin and hair related phenotypes that consistently across populations turn to be elevated in Neanderthal ancestry. So what's also interesting is this locus, this BNC to locus, which has the highest proportion of Neanderthal ancestry in Europeans, um, is also associated with uh, skin color and freckling and pigmentation. So again, there's a very strong connection with skin related phenotypes. Um, okay, now the, what about the deserts? So these are large regions, tens of megabases long, which are essentially devoid in Neanderthal ancestry. So here is one such desert on chromosome 7. Um, it's a desert both in Europeans and East Asians. And uh, uh, as an example, this desert is particularly striking because it contains this gene called FOXP2. Um, so this is a gene that has been shown to be important for speech and language. And, and so it's interesting that um, the region around this gene essentially is depleted for Neanderthal ancestry. So is it possible that what might be happening here is that there is purifying selection against Neanderthal ancestry? So to test this more quantitatively, we looked at the proportion of Neanderthal ancestry in bins of the genome, where the bins are computed based on something called the B statistic. So the B statistic is a measure of the selective constraint in different proportions of the genome. So as you move from the right to the left, you're moving to regions of the genome which are under stronger selective constraint. And so the basic observation is both in Europeans and East Asians, the Neanderthal ancestry decreases as you move towards regions of lower B statistic. So this is again telling us that consistent with the fact that there's been purifying selection uh, against these Neanderthal alleles. Um, could this again be an artifact of things like power? We did some simulations to confirm that that's not the case. Um, I, I won't spend much time on this. This is more recent evidence for selection. Um, and so what's going on here is, um, so there's so a couple of papers that came out earlier um, this year showed that what's happening is that there's selection on weakly deleterious Neanderthal alleles. And the reason is the, because of these low effective population sizes in Neanderthals, uh, they have a higher frequency of weakly deleterious alleles. Uh, and when they enter the larger human populations, they get purged more effectively. So that's, that's possibly explaining a large fraction of the signal. Um, we also evidence that um, there could be another mechanism underlying this, which is what's called hybrid sterility. And so this is what happens when you have two different populations um, that are actually um, separated for a, for a large period of time, coming back together and mixing. And so this has been observed in, uh, in other species. And we, can, we show that, the, that some of the purging of the Neanderthal alleles is consistent with the effects of um, hybrid sterility uh, in these populations. Um, it's the it's the offspring. So 
Uh, it's not entirely um, unique to the X chromosome. It could also happen on the autosomes. So it's, in fact, it's happening because of interactions between the X and the autosomes. Um, so for example, what we show is generally these are found to be concentrated on the X. And so if you look at the X chromosome, the Neanderthal ancestry is substantially reduced compared to the autosomes, both in Europeans and in East Asians. And uh, it's also found to be highly focused in sterility genes, in uh, testes expressed genes. These, uh, these genes are responsible for hybrid sterility. So when we look at Neanderthal ancestry in testes expressed genes, we find that there is a substantial reduction both in Europeans and East Asians. So it's kind of consistent, and we don't observe that for any of the other um, any of the other tissues we are looking at. So we are looking at 16 different tissues. It's only the testes which show uh, a reduction in, in Neanderthal ancestry. So again, that's consistent with this idea that there is hybrid sterility uh, at play here. Um, uh, phenotypic impact, I, I won't say much about that. We're doing analyses looking at GWAS-like uh, studies to understand the phenotypic impact. We have some initial results there. Um, another interesting thing that would be cool is uh, ancient DNA is limited in getting these uh, samples. Can we use the modern genomes to bootstrap and reconstruct these ancient genomes? And uh, to a limited extent, we can. Uh, we can use these large samples from the Thousand Genomes Project to build a better Neanderthal genome in some sense. Um, and I, won't, I, I, can, I can say more about that offline. But just to summarize, uh, I, I hope I've given you a kind of a picture of the underlying statistical methods. Uh, for characterizing different aspects of admixture, tests of admixture, estimating admixture parameters like times, and inferring local ancestries. Um, the other in thing that I want to say is because of uh, a lot of these ancient genome sequences, we have these new data sets and new tools to study evolution, and that's particularly exciting. And in the context of these Neanderthals, they're allowing us to do things like understand evolutionary changes that happened within the last 100,000 years in modern human history and, and to understand their effects. And of course, those are not the only instances. There are lots of other instances of archaic admixture I haven't talked about. There's the Denisovan admixture into Oceanians. Um, there's ad additional admixtures into the Denisovans from as yet unidentified archaics. And, uh, and, and those are all interesting and, and, and worth exploring. And we'll be looking into some of these questions. Um, so I'd like to end by thanking all my collaborators, uh, members of the Neanderthal Genome Consortium, um, and take any questions.